Hello and welcome to This Week in Computer Science 340. Today we're going to talk about the stack data structure. Now so far we've done arrays, linked list, singly linked list, and then also doubly linked list. All of those data structures are what I like to call physical data structures because they are concerned with how the data is like physically stored in memory. With an array, of course, you have all of the data being stored in sequential memory spots. So to get to all of the items, you just have to go through sequentially in memory. With a linked list, the difference is that you spread the data all around in memory, and you then have to use the links to get from one item to the next and to the next and so on. So both are concerned with physically how the data is laid out and how it's accessed. The stack is a different data structure. This is what I like to call a logical data structure because a stack, for a stack to be a stack, it doesn't have to store the data in any one particular way. It can store it like an array where it is all stored next to each other in memory, or it can be stored with a linked list where the data is all spread out and you use the next links to get from one item to the next. The thing that makes a stack a stack is like logically how you access it. It's sort of a pattern for accessing the data that makes it a stack. Now we've already talked about stacks in some sense in this class when we talked about calling methods. And I said that when you call a method, you push what is called a stack frame onto the stack. Um, it's sort of like the moon where we have like the moon, but there's also like other moons out there in the solar system. It's sort of like that with stacks because when you say the stack, what you're referring to is the method call stack that when you call methods, the stack frames get pushed on. But you can also make other stacks in your program and they work pretty much the same way as the stack for method calls. When you use a stack, you put things on the top and then you use the thing that's on the top and eventually take them back off to the bottom. So that's what we're gonna talk about this week. Let's go ahead and get started with this. All right, so a stack, again, is a data structure where the thing that makes it a stack is the pattern in which you access it. So with a stack, the way you access it is always on one end of the data structure called the top. So if we have a stack of numbers right here, 8, 26, 15, the top is 15. And whether we're adding or removing from the stack, we always do it on the top. So if I was to add a new number, like let's say 30, it couldn't go down here at the bottom, down there. That would not be allowed. Likewise, it could not be inserted between 15 and 26 or between 26 and eight. The only place that we can add the new data is on the top of the stack. So the 30 would have to go there and it would become the new top. Then if I want to add a new number on top of it, like, I don't know, let's say 20, you could not add it anywhere else on the stack except on top of the 30 like this. So this would be 20. When we add data to the stack, there's a specific term for that, which is called pushing. We push onto the stack. Now, if I wanted to access the stack, like look and see what value is in there, the only one that's visible is the top, which is now 20. We cannot even see that there's a 30, a 15, a 26, or an eight even in here. That's what makes a stack a stack. You can only ever see, add to, access, or remove from the very top of the stack. Now, getting to removing, if I wanted to remove an item from the stack, again, the only thing that can be removed is the 20. I cannot remove the 30, 15, 26, or eight at all. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove the 20 now, which leaves the stack looking like this. Now, 30 is the top of the stack because the 20 has been removed. This is called popping. When you take something off of the stack, you're said to pop it off the stack. I don't really know why it uses these terms. Um, they're just sort of traditional conventions. So adding to the stack is pushing and taking off of the stack is popping. Now it might be occurring to some of you that a stack is basically like an array or a linked list, except way more restrictive because with a linked list or an array, you can also add to one side and take off from that side, but you're also allowed to loop through all the data, add to the beginning, insert into the middle, remove from the middle and all that stuff. And you're totally right. A stack is basically like a linked list or an array that is more restrictive in the way that you use it. And the reason that this is a useful thing and a useful concept to talk about is because if you have a program or an algorithm or a problem where the stack is the right thing to be using, having this terminology of 
the stack data structure and its operations is a helpful thing because you can recognize, oh, you know, for this particular problem, the thing that I need is a stack. And it makes it easier than using an array or a linked list because you can just think of it in terms of the stack data structure and pushing and popping and sort of like using a specific special purpose tool to solve a problem is usually a lot easier than using a more general purpose tool, even though that general purpose tool can solve the same problem as well. So what things are stacks good at? Well, they're good at evaluating arithmetic expressions, which we'll see an example of in the next video. They're useful for reversing things, which we will see in the example today. Your lab for this week will be checking for mismatched parentheses. That's something else that's best solved with a stack. Keeping track of where you are in a maze. We'll see an example of that, I think, next week. You can use a stack to do that. And they're also used all over the place in implementing compilers and interpreters. Of course, you have the runtime stack of method calls, like we've already talked about, but they're useful in compilers besides that as well. When you give your Java code to the Java compiler, it has to parse and make sense of all the symbols in your code. And it turns out that a, a stack is the essential thing in the algorithm that basically does that. All right, so the next thing we need to talk about is how do you implement a stack data structure? Well, it turns out there's two main ways you can do it. One is using an array to store the underlying data, and the other is using a linked list to store the underlying data. We're gonna do it both ways. Today, we'll start off with using an array to implement a stack, and in the next video, we'll talk about using a linked list to implement a stack. Both ways work. And the one you should choose depends on sort of the trade-offs between arrays and linked lists that we already talked about. If you know how big the data is going to be to begin with, probably an array makes more sense. But if you are going to potentially have it grow and shrink quite a lot throughout the program and you don't want to be wasteful with memory, a linked list might make more sense. So in doing this, we're going to store basically two pieces of information. We're going to store the array itself. So we'll have a reference to the start of the array. And we're also going to store which element is the top element. And if the array is empty, the stack is empty to begin with, we're going to say that the top is equal to negative 1. And now let's say we want to push something onto the stack. We're going to push, I don't know, let's make it an array of characters. And let's say we're going to push the letter B onto the stack. Well, that's going to then go into slot zero, and zero is going to be the new top of the stack. So the B is going to go there, and then the top is going to be set from negative one to zero. So now, after we've pushed B onto the stack, we have one item in the stack, which is at the top and which is in slot zero. Now let's say we want to push another letter. Let's say we're going to push J this time. Well, J is going to go as you might imagine, I guess there's there's multiple ways to do this. We could scoot B over one and then have the top always be in slot zero, but that's going to be kind of inefficient because every time we add then, we're going to have to move everything down one, which we've said is, a waste, is expensive. It takes time to do that. So instead, what we're going to do is we're just going to put the new character that we're pushing into the next open slot, which is one, and then change top from zero to one, like that. Then, of course, if we want to push something else, like let's say we're pushing W, then the W is going to go down here, and then top is going to be incremented again to B2. So each time you push, you just take the slot in top plus one, basically, because the top is now two, and we're going to be pushing V into slot three. And then you increment top one like this. So now let's talk about popping. If after this we go ahead and pop, of course, the thing that we're going to remove has to be the V because that's the top of the stack. Remember, you're always adding and removing from the same end of the data structure with the stack, which in the array is the, the large side of the array, if you like, the, the big index side of the array, whereas zero is the bottom of the array of the stack. So if we pop, we need to take the V off of here. So what we're going to do is we're essentially going to decrement top so instead of being at three, it's going to be at two. And now you don't really need to like remove this out of here. If you want it, you could set it to null or set it to something zero, something like that, depending on what you're storing in the stack. But you could also just kind of leave it there and know that we're not going to access that one again. If we try to pop again, 
we're going to get slot two out of there because that's the current top. So the fact that this V is still here doesn't actually hurt anything. I don't think I mentioned this before, but pop does basically two things in a stack. It not only removes the top element, it also returns it back to you. So when we do this, we're going to have to write the method such that it not only removes V from the, from the stack, but it also returns it back to whoever called it. All right, let's pop again and see what will happen. We pop, we take the top slot, which is slot two, and return that, returning the W, and then we also go ahead and decrement this down. So instead of two, it would be one. And so that's basically all there is to it. It's pretty easy to use an array to implement the stack because again, a stack is basically just a more restricted form of an array anyway. So let's go ahead and look at the code for this. Rather than build it together like we did for the previous examples, I just kind of am giving you the code for it this time because it's pretty dang simple actually. Here we have a class that is using an array to implement a stack of integers. So we're storing the two things, like I said, we're storing the actual array. And I didn't make it generic because then we would have had to deal with that weird thing where Java doesn't like you making generic arrays. So I just hard coded this to be integer here. So we have our array of integers, which is actually storing the data that's stored in the stack. Then we have this top variable, which again, is an integer that keeps track of where in the array our top is located. We have a constructor, which takes the maximum size of the stack as a parameter, and it uses that to allocate the array that we're going to be storing. And like I said, when the stack is empty, top is negative one. Then the push basically does exactly what we talked about. You take the next open slot, which is gonna to be top plus one, and store the value that was given inside of there, and then you increment top. So let's go back to the whiteboard and see that this is working just to make sure we really, really go through this and we understand it. So we're setting the array at top plus one equal to the new value, and then we're incrementing top. So let's say we're pushing, I don't know, G. We go ahead and set array at top plus one. So top is three, top plus one therefore is four. So we go through and put the new value into slot top plus one and then we increment top, in this case, from three to four, like that. So that seems to work. That's really all there is to it for the push method. The pop is maybe slightly confusing because we do things a little bit out of order. So the problem is that in pop, like I said, we need to both return the value we're removing and then also remove it. And so you might say that we could write it like this, where we say like, okay, return, the array at top and then do top minus minus. That's how it logically maybe works. But the problem with that, of course, is that we can't return and then do something else afterwards because as soon as we do this return statement, we kick out of the method and there's no way that this other thing can happen. So we do things a little bit backwards in a way. We first decrement top because we need to make sure that happens. And then we return what was at the top, which is now at top plus one. So let's go ahead and make sure that works. So if we want to remove G from the stack by doing a pop operation, we first go ahead and decrement our top variable. So it goes from four back to three, and then we return the array at top plus one, which is the G. So the G gets returned out of here. And we don't, again, do anything to like take it out or anything that's not necessary at all. So hopefully that makes sense. And then we also put in an empty method that just returns whether or not top is equal to negative one. I might have written this in a slightly more like terse way than you're used to seeing it. So instead you can do something like this. You can say if top equals negative one, then you return what true, else you return false. And that's a way to do the same thing. But if you think about it, top equals negative one is already a Boolean statement. So we're basically saying, if this is true, return true, else if this is false, return false. So instead, why don't we just say, return the Boolean value, top equals to negative one. If top is equal to negative one, we're returning true. But if it's not equal to negative one, we're returning false. So this is sort of a more clean, streamlined way of doing that. Some students get confused by that at first though, so I thought I'd explain it. All right, and now just to test this out, we made a stack of 100 integers. 
and then we put the numbers one through 10 into the stack by calling our push method. Then we keep popping out the values until we are empty. And so I put this comment in here. I should have not because I was going to ask you uh, what will happen when we do this. But if you think about it, if we push all of these numbers one through 10 on the stack and then pop them all back out again, we will get them in reverse order. So let's see why that happens. So we start by pushing one onto the stack. So that's going to be down here. Oh, I drew that crooked. Now we push two onto the stack. So that goes here. Then we push three and then four and then five. I'll just stop at five. In the program, it goes to 10, but I'll stop at five here. Then we pop items off. And each time we pop it off, we print it. So the first thing we pop off is the five, which gets printed out and then it goes away. Then the top of the stack is four. So we pop that one off and then the four goes away. And then we pop the three off that gets printed and then the three goes away and so on for the two and the one. So if you want to reverse things, you can push them all onto a stack and then pop them all back off again. If they're stored already in an array or a doubly linked list, then you don't need to do that. But it, it's sort of more like if the pattern that you're using when you access things is to deal with the most recent thing first, using a stack is the best way to store them. All right, so if we go ahead and run this program, which is in array stack.java, we can see that that actually does work. And we get 10 through one, it does it backwards. All right, so the code for this little example is posted here on the website. We have our simple array-based stack thing. And so that's basically all there is to it. In the next lesson, we're going to talk about using a linked list to implement the stack instead, which isn't really very much more complicated either because we've already seen linked lists and seen how they work. And moreover, as we'll see, we can actually get away with a singly linked list for the stack. In the next one, we're also going to look at a slightly maybe cooler, or not cooler, but at least more uh, substantial example of using a stack, which is to implement a simple kind of calculator. I think it's cool. Maybe you'll think it's cool too. I don't know. But I'll see you next time for that. Thanks.